Chapter 1 Three years have passed since the finalization of our divorce. Beth and I were married for nearly 18 years, having been high school sweethearts who tied the knot shortly after graduation. We were each other's first and only love, a fact that holds significance in retrospect. Love, as we discovered, holds greater value than mere physical intimacy, and this realization often comes too late. Our life together was, for the most part, what many would consider good. We were blessed with four children, Amy, Brad, Carla, and Daryl, our alphabet kids, as we fondly called them. After Daryl's birth, I underwent a vasectomy, we felt content with our family of six. While Amy and Brad are now away at college, Carla and Daryl still reside with Beth, my former wife. What caused our seemingly happy families to unravel? Where did things go wrong? Initially, we appeared to be like any other content family, providing support and encouragement to our children. Like many young couples, we faced financial struggles, with me working in a manufacturing plant and Beth at the local Wall Asterisk March store once our older children entered school. With the younger ones in daycare while we worked, we often questioned how our predecessors managed without women in the workforce. Was it societal pressures or materialistic desires that led us astray? We chased after possessions and conveniences, losing sight of what truly mattered. Our romantic life began vibrantly, as it does for most young couples. However, as the responsibilities of parenthood grew, our physical intimacy waned. This decline is a common trajectory for many families, attributed to a lack of time and energy. Reflecting now, I realized that the root of the issue lay in our complacency. We took each other for granted, reducing our lovemaking to a perfunctory act devoid of the passion and tenderness it once held. It became routine, lacking the depth of connection we once shared. With my promotion to supervisor, our financial situation improved, affording us occasional outings. These outings, typically dinner and a movie, injected some excitement into our otherwise monotonous routine. It was a small step towards revitalizing our relationship, which, like many marriages, had grown stagnant due to familiarity. About four years ago, Beth expressed her desire to socialize with her female colleagues after work. Given that our children were now older and more independent, I saw no issue with her request. Beth dressed up for the occasion, always conscious of her appearance, though she looked beautiful regardless of her size. When she returned home, I inquired about her evening. Beth shared her experiences and conversations with the other women from work. While I held no prejudice against Wall Asterisk Mart employees, I couldn't shake the concern that many of them were divorced or separated, not the ideal crowd for Beth to be socializing with. My remarks seemed to strike a chord with her, igniting some frustration at my perceived criticism of her friends. I wasn't trying to judge your friends, I clarified. I just worry that you might be surrounded by people looking for relationships when you're already committed. Her reaction confirmed my suspicion. I knew her well after 18 years together. Did you dance with any man? I inquired. Beth hesitated before reluctantly admitting, yes, I danced with a couple of guys, but that's all. Although I suspected there was more to the story, I decided not to press her further at that moment. She informed me that she and her friends planned to go out monthly. While I wasn't thrilled about it, I felt powerless to object and decided to wait and see how things unfolded. The next month, Beth dressed in a skirt and pantyhose for her outing. I watched silently as she prepared to leave, our interaction brief and tense. Upon her return past midnight, I noticed her without the pantyhose she had worn earlier. You left wearing pantyhose. Where are they? I questioned. It was hot, so I took them off, she replied curtly. Beth, we need to talk. This is getting out of hand, I asserted. She requested privacy to change, but I insisted on confronting the issue. For the first time, I grabbed her arm firmly, a gesture I had never resorted to before. Don't, Jerry, please, she pleaded as I discovered she wasn't wearing any underwear beneath her skirt. Tears welled up in her eyes as I pushed her away. Her admission confirmed my suspicions. She had been unfaithful, her arousal evident from another man's encounter. Well, I suppose that explains the absence of pantyhose, I remarked bitterly. I'm sorry, Jerry. It just happened, she confessed, tears streaming down her cheeks. I've never been with anyone but you. 
Joe at the party, he kissed me and things escalated. And then others joined in. Others? I repeated, aghast. You let multiple men. I didn't mean to betray you or our marriage. It was impulsive, she pleaded, her voice trembling. Please, Jerry, I don't want to lose you. Come with me next time, please. Let's try it together. Her plea hung in the air, leaving me to grapple with the shattering revelation of her infidelity and the daunting prospect of confronting the fracture in our marriage. I needed time to process everything that had transpired. My thoughts were swirling, making it difficult to focus. I told Beth I couldn't discuss it further at that moment and suggested we reconvene the next day. Planning to spend the night on the couch, I sought solace in solitude. The next morning, after the kids had left for the day, I mechanically dressed for work. Beth was still asleep, exhausted from the events of the previous night. However, I found it impossible to concentrate on my job and ended up taking the afternoon off. I headed to Beth's workplace, where she was stationed as a cashier that day. Standing nearby was her friend Barb, whose name tag I noticed. Honey, why aren't you at work? Beth greeted me with a smile, unaware of the turmoil brewing within me. I'm meeting with Jeff, our lawyer today. I'm filing for divorce, I declared, turning to leave without waiting for a response. As I exited, I heard Beth's panicked voice calling after me, torn between attending to a customer and addressing my sudden announcement. Ignoring her pleas, I drove home, packing my belongings in haste and leaving a note for the kids, informing them of the impending divorce and leaving Beth to explain the situation. Seeking refuge, I retreated to my parents' home. Despite their affection for Beth, they offered their support, granting me access to the renovated basement, which served as a comfortable living space. Explaining the situation to them was challenging. I couldn't bear to disclose the true nature of our marital discord, opting instead for a vague explanation about irreconcilable differences. Upon consulting our lawyer, Jeff, I learned that Beth had already reached out to him multiple times, hoping to salvage our marriage. Despite his impartiality, Jeff's loyalty lay with Beth, having been enlisted by her first. His plea for reconciliation fell on deaf ears as I remained resolute in my decision to pursue a divorce. Did Beth tell you why I walked out, Jeff? Why I want a divorce? I inquired. She mentioned there was an argument about her going out. She admitted to drinking and cheating on you, Jeff responded. Let's cut to the chase, Jeff. After I expressed my concerns, she went out, slept with three men, and then suggested we swap partners with her friends. That's the situation, Jeff. I'll be consulting Sally Black. She's renowned in her field. I'll have her contact you once we have a plan. Thanks for your time, I stated firmly before leaving. Sally Black was known as the top divorce lawyer in the state, tough and uncompromising. I made an appointment with her for the next day. She advised me not to communicate with Beth until after our meeting. As for the kids, she suggested my parents inform them that we would talk in the coming days and to call them in case of emergencies. Later that day, Beth called my parents' house. I declined to speak with her, following Sally's advice. My dad relayed Sally's instructions, but Beth insisted on speaking with me. My dad, empathetic yet firm, conveyed Beth's message and expressed concern for my well-being. Afterward, I confided in my dad, asking him not to burden my mom with the truth to spare her feelings. The next day, I returned to work, grateful for the distraction it provided from the turmoil in my personal life. I informed my manager about my divorce proceedings and instructed him to filter out any non-urgent calls from Beth. Immersing myself in work helped keep my mind occupied. In the evening, I met with Sally. Despite her striking appearance, she maintained a strictly professional demeanor. Jerry, what are your objectives here? She inquired. I'm not entirely certain, Sally. I love Beth, always have and probably always will. I don't want to ruin her life, but I can't tolerate the lifestyle she's pursuing. I'm not interested in sharing her or engaging in casual encounters. My main concern is the well-being of our children. Though they're older, I don't want Beth bringing random people into their lives. I never thought she'd betray me like this, I explained candidly. Sally addressed me, Jerry, divorces like this happen every day. We can proceed however you prefer. 
Presumably, you want to keep the affair private for the kids' sake. You'll need to support them, and we can arrange the amount as you see fit. Ultimately, you have the control here. Initially, we might leverage the affair to expedite matters, but we'll ultimately cite irreconcilable differences. Does that sound agreeable to you? You're my legal counsel. I'll defer to your guidance, I affirmed. With your substantial income now, we could propose around $500 per week in child support, gradually decreasing as they come of age. No spousal support and financial responsibility ends when all the children are adults. You'll also cover their medical expenses. Regarding higher education, it's discretionary. Legally, you're not obligated. Your oldest is 17, the youngest 12, so support will continue for about six more years. Are you comfortable proceeding this way, or do you have other preferences? And what about our savings and my retirement package? I inquired. Your savings will be split evenly, along with shared bills. Each of you can keep one vehicle. Your retirement fund is off-limits, solely yours. As for the house and furnishings, what's your preference? Sally explained. The house is valued at around 200000 with 60000 remaining on the mortgage, and my kids reside there. I'm uncertain, I admitted. Here's a suggestion. Let her keep the house until the children reach adulthood, say 21. Then, it's sold, and proceeds divided equally. Alternatively, one party can buy out the other's share at half the value minus the mortgage. She'll be responsible for half the mortgage payments, Sally proposed. It's overwhelming. Why wasn't I enough for her? Eighteen years gone just like that. Let's proceed with that plan. What if either Beth or Jeff objects? I inquired. We'll then escalate, bringing up the affair. I doubt they want that exposed. If they do, we'll seek custody and an equal division of assets, with no support since she won't have custody, Sally explained. I took the following day off, and Sally arranged a meeting with Jeff and Beth. Jeff reluctantly agreed, knowing Sally's reputation. As we sat at the table, Jeff insisted Beth speak with me privately before any offers were made. I won't, I asserted. She had her chance to speak the other night. I'll only talk to her after the papers are signed. Everyone here knows why I'm seeking the divorce. I locked eyes with Beth. If you're worried about your private affairs being exposed, consider my offer. It's quite generous. Sally intervened. Well, that clears that up. Mrs. Cohen, Jerry has extended a fair offer to you. She handed copies of the document to Beth and Jeff. He's citing irreconcilable differences as the reason for the separation. As you can see, he's providing you with a reasonable income while the children are under your care. The only unresolved matter is the house, and Jerry has been equitable in his proposal. Jeff interjected, we need time to review this and consider a potential counteroffer. Sally, I'll discuss this with Beth and get back to you in the next few days. Jeff, let's be clear, Sally asserted firmly. There will be no counteroffer. Rejecting this offer would be unwise. If you do, Mr. Cohen will file for divorce on grounds of adultery and seek custody of the children and the house. Beth burst into tears, her fear evident. Sally's tough stance pained me as I watched Beth's distress. Beth reached for a pen, eager to sign without even reading. Her tears flowed freely. She was terrified of losing her children. Please, Mrs. Cohen, try to calm down, Sally urged gently. Jerry doesn't want to harm you or the children. Take a day or two, as Jeff suggested, to review the document. Maybe we overlooked something. I apologize for my stern tone, but I wanted to emphasize that this is a fair settlement. Jerry is ensuring your and your children's well-being. Please take the document, discuss it with your lawyer, and Jeff and I can reconvene tomorrow. Beth dabbed her eyes with tissues, looking at me as her tears subsided slightly. Jerry, I still love you, regardless of what you think. I hope we could reconcile with time, but it seems you've made your decision. No, Beth, you made it for me. You want freedom, and I'm granting it. All I ask is that you keep your affairs away from my kids, or I'll intervene. That's a promise. Beth wept anew as she hurried out. 
Jeff bid farewell and informed Sally he'd likely return the following day or soon after. Sally observed, looks like you're in a favorable position to win this case. I shook my head. There are no winners, just losers. I lost the woman I loved, and my kids now reside in a broken home. We didn't win, we merely reached a fair agreement. Later, my daughter Amy brought the younger kids to visit me at my parents' house. I was relieved to see them. They bombarded me with questions, and I reiterated that their mom and I had disagreements and were divorcing. I assured them that despite our separation, both their mother and I would always be there for them. Daryl, I'll be there at your games, cheering you on. And Carla, when volleyball season rolls around, count on me in the stands, rooting for you. I'll always be a part of your lives, I assured them, embracing and kissing each of my children. They reciprocated with declarations of love, and I made sure they had my cell phone number, emphasizing they could reach me anytime, even at Grandma's house. Brad arrived later with a weighty question. Dad, I gotta ask. Did you cheat on Mom? No, Brad, I'd never do that to your mom. Why do you ask? Well, Jim, my buddy at school, and Travis, our neighbor, said their dads cheated, and that's why their parents got divorced. I just hoped you didn't do something like that. I love you, Dad, and I'll miss you, Brad confessed. Brad, I'm not going anywhere far. I'll always be here for you kids. It'll just take some adjusting to our new situation, I reassured him, squeezing his shoulder. Chapter 2 The divorce was finalized, and I made good on my promise to be there for my kids. I attended most of their school events, often running into Beth, who remained a dedicated mother. If she was involved in any relationships, she kept them private. Beth and I maintained an amicable relationship. We came together for the kids' birthdays and special occasions, though we agreed not to discuss her dating life. Our conversations revolved around the children, holidays, and family matters. Whenever she veered into personal topics, I excused myself. The agreement Sally drafted was signed by all parties, though I wasn't present when Beth signed. Sally mentioned Beth struggled with it. Jeff and I clashed over financial matters like credit card payments, but I assured Sally I'd handle it if needed. We canceled joint credit cards and obtained new ones in separate names. I kept in touch with the kids, who noted Beth seemed more content since the divorce. They assured me she wasn't dating, just occasionally going out with friends. It unsettled me a bit to hear that. I never had that heart-to-heart -heart with Beth. She sought freedom to explore, a notion foreign to me. I was raised to believe in commitment. Perhaps we married too young, denying her the chance to discover what she's seeking. I, too, refrained from exploring other relationships. I was content with Beth. A couple of years later, I dipped my toes into the dating pool, mostly with divorced women from work. I made it a rule to avoid married women, even if separated. There was always a nagging feeling inside me. While I engaged in relationships and treated them respectfully, my thoughts often drifted to Beth. It's strange how you can't just move on. I tried, really tried. But none of the women I dated measured up. The highlights were always the family gatherings, where I glimpsed Beth. Last year, I ventured out with my work buddies to a lively lounge they recommended, boasting a crowd of women. And guess who I spotted there? It seemed like a ladies' night out, and there she was, surrounded by friends I didn't recognize, except for Barb, who was notably absent. Approaching Beth from the side to catch her off guard, I asked, Care to dance? Jerry, what are you doing here? She inquired, surprised. Just out with the guys. Are you waiting for someone or care to dance? I responded. No, yes. I mean, no, I'm not waiting for anyone, and yes, I'd love to dance with you. Let me introduce you to my friends, she said, listing off names and explaining they were from their card club, out for a change tonight. We hit the dance floor, reminiscing as we swayed to the music. After a couple of slow dances, a fast one came on, and I admitted I never could dance to these types of songs, escorting her back to her table. Though she seemed disappointed, I bid her friends farewell and made my exit, feeling unsettled about leaving her alone. The next day, she reached out, expressing her pleasure at seeing me out and about. 
She also asked if I'd help plan Amy's wedding reception. My oldest daughter was tying the knot. It felt surreal. It seemed like yesterday I held her in my arms, and now she was about to embark on her own journey with her partner. Beth's call, the day after our encounter, struck me as odd, considering Amy's wedding was a year away. I voiced my reservations, suggesting it was too early to plan, but Beth explained the need for advanced reservations. I encouraged her to discuss arrangements with Amy first, as it was her special day. Once they had ideas in place, I'd handle the financial aspect. She agreed and promised to talk to Amy first. I wanted to make it clear to Beth that one dance didn't signify a reconciliation between us. About a month later, I decided to check in on the wedding plans and gave Beth a call. Carla answered and informed me that her mom had gone out with friends. Though I felt a twinge of irritation, I knew I had no right to be upset. After all, we'd been divorced for over two and a half years. Curious, I asked Carla if her mom went out often, to which she revealed it was about once a month. Feeling a mix of emotions, I phoned my buddy Pete and proposed a visit to the lounge. Being divorced himself, he was keen on the idea of mingling with the ladies. As we entered the bustling venue, I spotted Beth seated among a group of people, both men and women. Dismissing any thoughts of confrontation, I resolved to find another woman to dance with. My gaze fell upon a young woman, likely around 30, dressed provocatively in a mini skirt and without a bra. Pete couldn't help but comment on her allure, pointing out a group of similarly dressed women nearby. There were only a couple of tables away from Beth and her friends. As I headed towards Beth's table, she noticed me and seemed taken aback. Ignoring her reaction, I approached the table with the enticing young woman. Care to dance? I asked, extending the invitation. Sure, I like older men, especially good-looking ones, she responded with a playful tone, loud enough for Beth to hear. We hit the dance floor, and I held her close, her breasts pressed against me. Introducing myself as Jerry, I complimented her beauty. Our proximity to Beth's table was deliberate, and I noticed the men there ogling Rachel's legs. Giving them something more to look at, I subtly adjusted Rachel's skirt. Even when a fast song played, Rachel and I remained on the floor, much to Beth's likely chagrin, as I seldom danced fast songs with her. After a slow dance followed, during which I indulged in a subtle squeeze of Rachel's rear, I escorted her back to my table, suggesting another dance later. I'd like that, Rachel replied with a smile, as Pete returned to our table after dancing with one of the other women from Rachel's group. I was casually sipping my drink when Pete nudged me, pointing out a woman approaching our table. Here comes a nice-looking lady, he remarked, unaware that the woman was none other than Beth, my ex-wife. Will you dance with me? she asked, directing her question at me. Glancing at Pete, I pretended as if she had spoken to him. Jerry, answer me, she insisted. Standing up, I replied, it would be a pleasure. Then, turning to Pete, I introduced Beth as my ex-wife, leaving him momentarily stunned, having just referred to her as a broad. As Beth and I danced, she couldn't help but comment on the woman who had approached me earlier. What was that all about? She was all over you. God, she would have slept with you on the dance floor if you'd asked, she remarked. Isn't that why we're divorced? You wanted me to be with other women so you could be with other men? I retorted. Jerry, please, we never discussed it. I was wrong, Beth conceded. Look, Beth, you came home with other men's semen dripping out of you, and all you can say is, I was wrong. Maybe I should go and be with that woman, and then I can say I was wrong too. Besides, we're not married now. When you went on your escapade, you were my wife, damn it. Before long, a guy approached us on the dance floor, questioning Beth's choice to dance with me instead of him. Annoyed, I warned him off and asserted my status as her husband, causing Beth considerable embarrassment. As Beth began to speak, I cut her off. Do you want to sit with me or go back to your boyfriend here? I asked. Beth, visibly angry, retreated to her table. Seizing the opportunity, I confronted the guy, threatening him to stay away from Beth before letting him go. Soon after, the two young women we had danced with earlier joined us at our table. Sensing Beth's gaze, I shamelessly flirted with the women, fully aware that she was watching. Pete too, seemed to be making advances. 
These women were there with a clear intention, and we were playing right into it. One of the blondes, feeling bold, suggested we leave, admitting she was feeling aroused. Before departing, I asked her to deliver a message to Beth that her wish for the evening would be fulfilled. With a mischievous grin, she relayed the message to Beth, who was left seething as we made our exit. We ended up having a wild night with those two attractive women at Pete's apartment. We even swapped partners throughout the night. Despite the enjoyable sex, something was missing afterward, the emotional connection. When I finally checked my phone, I found ten messages from Beth, all filled with anger and frustration. One of her messages about me ruining her evening oddly made me feel a bit satisfied. I decided to call her around nine in the morning to see if she had calmed down. Initially, she continued to vent her anger at me, but then she suddenly stopped. How does it feel, Beth? To know the person you love is with someone else. This is the life you chose. You do what you want, and so will I. Love doesn't matter anymore. I could hear her crying as I hung up. I didn't hear from her for a couple of weeks until she called one day. Jerry, can we talk? I mean about everything. I know it hurt you to see me with someone else, just like it hurt me to see you with that woman. Beth, it's in the past now. You can do what you want. I don't care anymore. I just wanted you to understand how it felt. Jerry, I haven't been with anyone in two and a half years. The last time was a month after you left. It wasn't fulfilling. It felt empty. I realized I don't want that life. I want what we once had. Honest, two and a half years. What about that guy a few weeks ago? He claimed to be your date, and it seemed like he had other intentions. He was just a friend of someone at our table. When you embarrassed me, I went back to the table, and he assumed he could be with me. I had no intention of anything more than dancing. And no, I didn't sleep with him. By the way, what happened to your friend Barb? They don't go to the club anymore. Barb and her husband got divorced after trying to spice up their marriage with swinging. It ended badly. I found it strange that she brought up the club since she hadn't mentioned it in years. Changing the subject, I asked, how are the wedding plans for Amy going? I assumed you knew all about them since Amy has spoken to you about it. I figured you didn't want to be alone with me, so we handled the plans and just had you verify them. I'm not afraid to be alone with you, Beth, I asserted. Oh, really? I don't believe you. If you're not scared, then take me out on a date, she teased. I don't think that's wise, Beth. It might send the wrong message. People might think we're reconciling, I explained. I knew you were afraid. You still love me, just like I love you. You're just not admitting it, she insisted. Beth, I do love you, but the pain of what you did is still fresh. I see it every time I look at you. When you betrayed me, it shattered a part of my heart. I'm not sure if it's healed yet. I don't know if it ever will, I confessed. God, I'm so sorry. There's nothing I can do. I ruined our marriage, I lost the man I loved, and I live with the guilt every day. I've even thought about ending my own life, but I can't do that to the kids. I've hurt them enough. I've held on to hope that maybe, just maybe, we could reconcile someday, she admitted. I was overwhelmed. We had never spoken like this before. My mind was spinning. I still loved her, but I also hated what she did. What if she acted on her thoughts? Was she trying to guilt trip me? I needed more information before I could trust her. I couldn't bear the thought of her taking her own life. I thought I knew her well enough to tell if she was lying, but now I wasn't so sure. I had to find out the truth, but how? Beth, I'm getting hungry. Would you like to join me for lunch at Red Lobster? We can discuss what to give Amy for her wedding present, I suggested. Her response was tears for the next 30 seconds. Then she softly said, I'd love to. But, Beth, understand this isn't about romance. It's just lunch and wedding planning, I clarified. I understand, she said, her voice hinting at a smile. I picked her up, and there she was, standing on the porch, radiant in a dress that accentuated her legs. She practically ran to the car, and as she got in, she smiled. 
we kept our conversation light, avoiding the heavy topics. She mentioned buying a dress for the wedding and reminded me to get measured for a tux. Without thinking, I asked if she would come along to see how I looked. It just slipped out. I was used to seeking her opinion. Surprised, she agreed. It was unexpected, and I realized I had to be cautious. I could easily fall back into old habits. At the restaurant, we ordered iced tea, our usual choice. We had so much in common. Beth, I need to ask you something, but I need to hear the truth. I promise we won't talk about it again afterward. Did you really mean what you said about taking your own life? She looked at me, a tear glistening in her eye. Don't worry, I won't cry. I've shed enough tears in the last three years. Yes, I did mean it. I told you I went out once after you left. It sounds stupid now, but I did it to get back at you. Get back at me? I don't understand. I was confused, feeling abandoned by you. I know it wasn't your fault, but in the moment, I wasn't thinking clearly. So, I went out again, seeking revenge. But I wasn't enjoying it at all. When he called me his slut, I snapped, slapped him, and left, crying. The kids were asleep, and I felt like my world was falling apart. I almost took sleeping pills, but Carla asked to sleep with me. She needed me. Holding my little girl, I prayed for strength. I realized my kids needed me, and maybe you would see a change and want me back. Her words brought tears to my eyes. Thankfully, our food arrived, and we changed the subject, focusing on eating. Later, I suggested we go see a comedy to lift our spirits. I dropped her off at home, and she invited me in. I declined, saying I needed to think. As she got out, she leaned over it and kissed me. I didn't stop her, it felt right. I love you, Jerry, remember that, she said before heading inside. Something didn't add up. She claimed she only swapped partners once, yet there were inconsistencies. If she went to a swap club, she'd need a partner. Who was hers? And what about the possible suicide? She only mentioned the sleeping pills. I wanted to trust her, but I needed answers. Her monthly outings for the past two and a half years puzzled me. The kids never mentioned anyone. Perhaps she was telling the truth, and I was being paranoid. We spent our free time preparing for Amy's wedding. I had lunch with Beth, Amy, Brad, and Ben, Amy's fiancé, before our tux fittings. I felt ridiculous in mine, but Amy and Beth insisted I looked handsome. Time flew by, and it was time for the wedding rehearsal. Afterward, we gathered at a restaurant. Before leaving, Beth approached me. I hadn't spoken much to her that evening. Jerry, I'll see you tomorrow, she said in a way that made me lean in and kiss her. Maybe it was the happiness of the occasion, I couldn't say for sure. She smiled, and I left. I arrived at the church early, following instructions. The bridesmaids and ushers were already there, and soon guests started to arrive. I felt a bit nervous. Beth was being escorted to the front row, looking stunning. I'd never seen her more radiant as she smiled at me. How's my penguin today? She chuckled. He's scared shitless. His daughter is getting married, and his wife never looked more beautiful, I replied, realizing the truth in my words. It's okay, honey, everything will work out fine. You'll do fine, just don't walk on Amy's dress, she reassured me with a smile. I went to the back of the church and waited for Amy. When I saw her approaching, tears welled up in my eyes. She looked like a younger version of Beth. It's okay, Daddy. We can do this. Mom told me to tell you she loves you and not to step on my dress, Amy said, echoing her mother's words. It made me chuckle, although I hoped Amy wouldn't be exactly like her mother. My little girl was getting married. As the music started, we made our way down the aisle, and I reminded myself not to step on Amy's dress. Tears filled my eyes as I walked her down. This was what life was about, love, family, and friends. We reached the front of the church, where many had tears of joy in their eyes. Who gives this woman to be married? The pastor asked. What was my line? Me and Beth, no, her mother and I, I stumbled. Turning to sit next to Beth, I found her smiling and crying. I screwed up. 
one stupid line and I screwed it up. I whispered to her. Everything is fine, honey, you did great, she whispered back. Throughout the service, I held Beth's hand tightly, probably hurting her. She didn't complain, just smiled and cried. I was relieved when the service ended, although we had to endure more pictures and formalities. Then came the reception. I needed a drink and got one. Everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves. Amy and Ben made a lovely couple. People commented on how nice it was to see Beth and me together. Beth just smiled each time, not saying a word. As the dancing began, they announced the parents of the bride dance. I led Beth onto the floor, and people started clapping for us. Seeing our kids smiling, and my parents giving me a thumbs up, everyone seemed convinced about us, except me. After the wedding, Beth asked if I would drive her home. I agreed, and when we arrived, she invited me in. I replied, the kids will be home shortly, and I don't want them to get the wrong idea. They already have the wrong idea. They went home with your mom and dad and will be sleeping in your bed. The only place for you to sleep tonight is in my bed or Brad's, Beth retorted. Are you going to open my door for me? She added with a smile. Deciding to follow my heart, I walked her to the door and opened it. She invited me in, and I agreed, but I made sure not to propose or rush into anything. There were still too many unanswered questions. As we undressed slowly, I couldn't help but marvel at how beautiful she was. She told me it was because I was looking at her through love glasses. We made love that night, over and over again. In the morning, after one last intimate moment, she made breakfast. Jerry, I'm not going to push you or rush you, but I'll always be here for you. As long as it takes, she said sincerely. I smiled at Beth and left the house without kissing her goodbye on purpose. I wanted her to know that while the sex was great, I wasn't ready to commit yet. But now I had a new problem to ponder. Beth had done things with me that we had never done before, yet she claimed to have been without a lover for almost three years. Something didn't add up. Everything was too smooth, too perfect. For over two years, Beth never mentioned getting back together, but suddenly in the last year, she was throwing herself at me. I needed to know more. When I got back to Mom and Dad's, everyone had left. Dad asked me if everything was okay because I seemed out of sorts. I explained to him that something wasn't right and I needed to find out what it was. Even though it was Sunday, I called Sally, my lawyer. I explained the situation and she agreed that it was odd. She advised me not to say anything for a couple of days. She had a private investigator who could find out what was going on. Beth called on Monday and asked me over for dinner, but I declined, saying I was busy and would take a rain check. I didn't tell her I was getting antsy trying to piece everything together and kept coming up short. On Thursday, Sally called me at work and asked me to come to her office as soon as possible. She said it was extremely important. I asked for the rest of the day off and went to see Sally. When I arrived, Sally told me things I didn't want to hear. I was right about Beth. She belonged to a swap club, and her partner was Jeff, her lawyer. It seems that after I left, Jeff decided to take my place. Beth never decided to quit her lifestyle, she just hid it from me. I asked Sally why Beth was coming back to me in the last year. She had her freedom and her life. Why bother me? It's all about money, Jerry. In the last three years, she has borrowed from the home loan to the tune of $100,000. Instead of owing the 60000 you owe 160000 Sally explained. How did she get it? Didn't she need my signature to borrow money against the house? I asked. No, when you settled on the credit cards, one was a cash equity loan. You could borrow continually on it to a specified sum. Yours is almost there now. Your friend Jeff slipped that one past us. There was no way of telling once you agreed to pay the credit loans. I'm sorry, Jerry, I should have watched that after the divorce was final. We don't usually do a follow-up unless asked, and of course Jeff wasn't going to ask. Sally, when I spent the night with her, I checked through the cabinets for her prescription drugs. There weren't any, so I called the doctor, and he told me he never wrote a prescription for sleeping pills in the last three years, and that Beth has been there for all her physicals. 
He said she was actually coming every three months instead of six. I asked if she asked to be tested for any sexually transmitted diseases, and he told me she had the tests done and is clean. Thank God for at least that, I thought. By me paying the medical bills, I was at least able to find out this stuff. Well, Sally, what do we do now? I asked. The only debt you incurred is the house. We'll put a lien on it for 40000 and if she ever tries to sell it, you'll get that part of the equity. The rest is a loss to you. As far as the kids go, two are already out of the house. The other two are old enough to decide if they want to live with your ex-wife, with you, or your parents. We will leave that up to them. Jerry, since you told me you will be leaving the state, you will probably be out of the picture. I'm sure they would want to finish the last years of their schooling here. Thanks for everything, Sally. I guess it's all up to me now. Please call and put the freeze on the equity on the house. If the kids choose to live with my mom and dad, I'll need you to transfer the child support payment to my parents. I went home and talked to my mom and dad. I told them both that I could never go back to Beth. Even though my dad already knew, I explained it as though he didn't. Beth cheated on me, and I hoped she had given up that lifestyle, but she hadn't. If she would have been honest with me, we might have been able to work things out. I knew my parents were deeply hurt, but they needed to know the truth. I stopped by Beth's house while she was at work. I came right out and told the kids the truth. Their mom had cheated on me. I didn't tell them about swapping and the like. I tried to give her time to change, but she never did. I thought we had a chance at the wedding, but found out she was still lying to me. I could never live with her or trust her again. It just wasn't possible to forgive anymore. Now I had to inform them about my decision to leave the state. They had the option to come with me, stay with their mom, or live with their grandparents. Both of the younger kids chose to stay with their mom. Despite the possibility of her having boyfriends, she never brought them home. Carla mentioned she never saw any unfamiliar men at the house. Besides relatives, the only visitor was Jeff, whom they've known for years. I couldn't bring myself to tell them that Jeff was one of her lovers. They all cried, expressing how much they would miss me, but I reassured them that I would only be five hours away and available if they needed me. They were also welcome to visit me any time. When are you leaving, Dad? Brad asked. Next week. Once I'm settled, I'll give you my address and phone number. I love all of you and will help you any way I can. I called Beth at work, something I had never done before. Beth, let's meet at the tavern. I need to talk to you away from the kids. She said she would be there in an hour after finishing work. I could imagine she thought her plan had succeeded and we would reconcile. When she arrived, I started the conversation. Beth, I've been reflecting a lot. Because of Amy's wedding and our night together, everyone assumes we're getting back together. It's all moving too fast for me. Do you realize no one knows why we got divorced? Looking back at your life over the past three years, where's the pain? The hurt I felt when I discovered your infidelity. It seems non-existent. Sure, your financial struggles hurt, but that was the extent of it. She looked at me with concern. I continued, our night together was amazing. You did things we've never done before. I recall you used to find them too risque, yet there you were. I couldn't help but wonder where you learned those things. Jerry, I can explain, she began. Here's what I need you to explain. You claimed you hadn't been with anyone for two and a half years. Why lie to me? You had your monthly girls' nights out, and it turns out the women from your work and car club were also members of the swap club. So, I suppose you've been getting your satisfaction after all. She started crying again. Your affairs caused our divorce, and you never stopped. Go ahead, explain it. Go home and tell your kids why I left in the first place. Let them know your desires override our marriage vows. They deserve to know and are old enough to understand. I've already talked to them. God, Jerry, surely you didn't tell them about me, did you? Beth asked, her voice tinged with concern. It's always about you, isn't it, Beth? Never about your kids or me. I told them you had an affair and cheated on me, I replied firmly. 
Jerry, I'm so sorry. You left me, what could I do? I'm a woman and need to be loved, she pleaded. You don't want love. What I did the other night was love. What you want is unlimited orgasms with unlimited partners. Did you think I would never find out? How foolish do you think I am? I had wondered what if we got married and then I caught you cheating again. Then it hit me. Your lover Jeff was behind this setup, I explained, my voice filled with a mix of anger and disappointment. Jeff? How did you find out about Jeff? Oh, my God, what have I done? Beth exclaimed, her voice trembling with regret. What have you done? You've ruined a lot of lives, including your own. You gave up a man who truly loved you and was almost ready to come back to you. You've lost the respect of your kids, even though they'll still live with you. You've deeply hurt them all. You lie, you cheat, and now you want to take from me too. The love I had for you is still there, but buried deep in my heart. All I see now is a deceitful person who will do anything for pleasure. In a couple of years, I want you to think about what could have been. Your looks will fade, your kids will be gone, and so will the money. You may have a bunch of old friends and, of course, Jeff. I doubt if he'll stick around with a poor woman, I said, my words cutting like a knife. She sobbed uncontrollably. Jerry, I really do love you. Please stay with me. I'll go to therapy or whatever you want, she pleaded desperately. I turned to her, my expression cold. I forgot to tell you, I'm moving out of state and leaving next week. Thanks for the farewell. You're skilled in bed, but of course, you already knew that just like God knows how many men. Goodbye, Beth. Have a nice life. I knew Jeff was behind this setup. If I had remarried her, it would have meant accepting her lifestyle and our old marriage agreement would be void. She and Jeff had played me for the past year because of the money. She was already down a hundred a month and deeply in debt again, yet living the same lavish lifestyle. It must mean she had run up a significant debt. Such a foolish woman. Epilogue, I finally moved on with my life. I hurt for a while, but I was leaving it all behind. Did I love Beth? Of course I did, but her actions were too much to bear. It's been a few years now, and I met someone. She was younger, beautiful, articulate, and funny. She told me she was divorced and had two kids barely in their teens. When I inquired about the cause of her divorce, she explained, a cheating husband. He wanted the so-called good life, you know, the include other people's style. It wasn't for me. I'm a one-guy kind of woman. I also have to think about what's best for my kids. I told him to find a woman who thinks like that, but it wasn't me. We dated for about a year before I proposed to her. When she asked what the marriage vows meant to me, I replied, to love, honor, and cherish, till death do us part, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to be faithful to you and you alone. I can do all that except the obey part, I chuckled. Knowing my story and about my alphabet kids, she laughed too. You see, her son was named Aaron and her daughter was Faith. We got married and all my kids attended the wedding. At first, they were hesitant to come, but after meeting my future wife, they saw the kind, gentle person that I saw. Amy and Brad were already married, and Carla was dating. Daryl and Carla were both still in college. They knew I needed someone in my life. Mom and Dad also attended the wedding and fell in love with my bride. They knew my life was back on track. My wife looked stunning, petite, and irresistibly sexy. Why any man would want to share her was beyond me. We went on a short honeymoon and visited Mom and Dad on the way back. I showed my new wife around town and the house I used to live in, which Beth had to sell because of her debts. Thankfully, I got 30000 out of it, thanks to Sally, my lawyer. We returned home and started our new life together. It was simple but filled with happiness. We cherished each moment and our intimacy was incredible. We only had one issue to resolve. My new wife's name was Bethany. She didn't want me to call her Beth, so we settled on Honey. She didn't mind what others called her, but insisted on hearing only honey from my lips. Occasionally, I asked if I could call her sweetheart. She smiled and said, that would be okay too. 
When we make love, you can call me anything you want, but Beth, she teased. As for Beth, I've removed her from my life. The kids keep tabs on her and say she's living alone in an apartment, seemingly doing okay. They think she might be dating, but don't discuss it much. They mentioned she cried when she learned about my marriage. They love their mom and look out for her. She'll be all right, they assured me. I just hope she's left behind some of her wild ways. But I suppose I'll never know for sure. I recall the last thing she said to me. Jerry, I really do love you and want you to know that I will wait for you. I know you'll come back to me. I'll be here for as long as it takes. To which I replied, forever is a long time to wait. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel not to miss new videos.